Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number three of my YouTube series called The Heart of Chess. My name is Vijir. I'm hoping everyone's having a good n night right now. And I'm saying night because my time schedule is so messed up. I have so many things I'm working on. I'm now invigorated to even produce more YouTube content. I already have a couple of uh, things in works. Uh, along with the heart of chess, but I really want to prioritize this because I think this is what drew everyone's interest of how I was going to articulate and speak about chess in a different fashion. So I've noticed that there's a lot of comments really kind of anticipating this particular part in the series, and I think it's really important that we have an idea of what separates the different ELO groups. And this is my two cents, which I think I'm going to bring towards the table. And again, this is the cool thing about chess. We all have our own opinions. And some of you will agree with what I say. Some of you might not really understand it. And some of you might completely disagree and think it's completely the other way around. And the point is that that's good. It's better to have this type of conversation because either way, we're all going to grow in the end. So this is a chess game that actually took place in a tournament 11 years ago. And you're like, 11 years ago? Why would you do that? Well, in terms of the purpose of this video, this video is going to talk about the difference between a 1200 ELO player and a 1500 ELO player. And because of the lessons of what I'm going to talk about in terms of the difference between ELO, the older the game the game itself, the age, doesn't really matter. It, it doesn't really have any consideration when it comes to this purpose of, of this video. So this is a tournament that took place 11 years ago, and this was uh, the Ontario High School Chess Championship where I participated in. It was the second tournament I played, and this is where I came second. And after looking at the games I played and the people that were in this tournament, God only knows how I got second place. Because everyone was at least, I came rated as officially a 1680 player because my first tournament I started 1500 and then after I won I got to 1680. Although in, at that time I think I was rated at least in my mind, I think I was at least 1800-ish, maybe 1850 at that time. So I was definitely a lot stronger in my rating. But the people in this tournament were 2100s, 1800s, but then there was also a lower ELO player too. So there was a like nice mix. And it was quite exciting. And I'm going to pull out some of those games later on and use them as lessons. And it'll be kind of cool reminiscing about it. And I was able to pull up this information because I did the video about my dad just the other day, which I hope everyone enjoyed that video. So I did some digging and I found the a URL of the tournament. And then I searched it and it had all that information. So I was really happy I was able to pull up some old memories of chess. So this is a game between white, which is, the player's name is Arjun, and black, whose name is Kevin. Now, the white player is 1606, and the black player is 1366 ELO. So I figured this is a good balance, uh, almost 300, uh, sorry, 300 point difference. So what separates the 1200 and the 1500 player? The way I look at things I think that it is the understanding between both of those groups that really separates a 1,200 player from a 1,500 player. And when I talk about the understanding, it's not necessarily the knowledge of opens. Knowledge is actually completely different, and that will be talked about in another video. The understanding is to understand like the following principles of chess. Do you know to go for the center? Do you know what moves are active, what moves are not? Um, not to do a repetitive move unless there's purpose. Do you have a plan? Do, can you see tactics, skewers, pins? Can you manipulate the board to fit your style? Because again, that's the thing too is that you, we're always advantageous when we're in a comfortable spot. If you're someone that likes complication, you're very technical, then obviously you want to complicate the board because there's a better chance that you will have a you will feel better in this spot than your opponent does, which gives you an edge and that can then turn to an advantage. 
So that's something that we're going to hear in chess a lot, or if you already know. Edges become advantages, and once you become advantages, then you can convert it into possible winning chances. That's kind of like the formula right there. So we're going to go right into this game, and I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm not going to analyze it right now with you. I'm just going to play the entire game out, and I just want you to be very observant of the game, because after I play the game first, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to consider these questions. And then after you come up with an answer, you can write it down or visualize it in your head. Then we're going to go back through the entire game and then go really in detail behind it. All right, so here we go. It started off very simple. E4 was played, followed by C5. So again, already, Sicilian defense is one of the most common openings. And even in lower ELOs, you'll see it's 100% of the time. Next was knight f3 followed by knight c6. Again, there's three different ways you can do this that are very common. You can do the, uh, you can go backwards and you can go with the e6, or you can go with the d6. So there's a lot of different ways you can do it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, I'm, I've never actually used the software before on, on lead chess, so I, I apologize if I seem newbish in, in clicking pieces, etc. Next we have d4, which is very common, followed by c x d. Knight d4 was then played, followed by knight f6. So again, nothing special. Uh, it seems that both opponents know the basics of the Sicilian defense, which in this case right now we're in the open variation. Knight c3 was played, followed by d6. So now black has committed a move. Uh, they play d6. Again, there's many different ways you can do this. And usually, most cases, you would want to follow with the a6 to prevent this spot right here to, uh, from the white knight, because that could be a little bit troublesome. And we have bishop e3, developing move, followed by a6. So, just like I talked about earlier. Bishop c4 was then played, then g6, and castle for white. Black plays queen c7, and bishop goes to to bishop b3. Black plays bishop g7, and then white plays f3, so central uh, strengthening the e4 pawn. Black castles, and queen goes to d2 for white. Black plays bishop d7, and white decides to push the knight into the ter black's territory by playing it at d5. Black decides to capture with their knight on f6, and white returns with taking the knight at d5. Black plays e6, and bishop b3 gets returned back. Now, again, I'm going a little fast because I'm going to recap everything in detail later on. I just want everyone to go through the game and just see how it plays along. And again, this is kind of the test. Rook a c8 is played by black followed by c3 for white, and black plays knight a5. White plays rook f d1, and black plays rook f e8. Bishop is played to f2 for white, followed by e5 for black. Knight is played at c2, and black decides to capture the bishop on b3. White follows up by a x b. And rook goes to bishop. Uh, to, sorry, rook goes to e6. Knight's played to a3. Bishop responds with black responds with bishop to f8. And knight's played to c4. Black responds with black bishop to b5. And knight goes into bishop uh, to b6. Rook moves out of the way by going to d8. And white goes to d5 with the knight. Queen goes to d7. And white responds with playing the bishop on h4. Bishop goes to g7 for black. And bishop takes the rook on d8, which is followed up by queen taking the bishop on d8. Pawns push to c4 for white. Black responds by playing bishop to c6. Queen goes to a5 for white, 
and rook to e8 is played for black. Queens are exchanged off the board, and knights play to e7, checking the king. Black responds by pulling the king on f8, and knight takes off, gets their bishop off the board, followed by pawn taking the knight. White takes the pawn on a6, and c5 is played for black. Rook takes the pawn on d6 with the a rook, and the exchange of rooks come off the board. Black plays knight to king to e8, and white responds by playing the rook on d5. And after this move, the game is over, and black resigns. Now, I want you to consider these following questions as I'm about to recap into the game. I want you to ask yourself first, where did you notice the difference between the strength of both players? And I want you to be very clear with that because in the opening, it was solid. There was It was pretty equal. Uh, white and black were playing, playing, playing pretty much an equal game in terms of the opening. So definitely the understanding of the openings was there. And once you mentally in your mind decide where was the turning point of the deviation of the skill level, that is going to consciously help you later on when you're playing chess. If you're a 1200 ELO player and you start to build your understanding of where, when the tide has changed, you can then take that opportunity in your games to either A, avoid it coming from your opponent, or B, you take advantage and initiate that that process for you to take over the game and make the tide change the tides towards your favor so consider that now do you think that this game should have ended this fast that's something to consider too and I'll, I'll give an answer later on when we go right into the game so take give yourself about 15 20 seconds recap the game in your mind uh, if you're having trouble recapping the game in your mind, that's fine. That's something that you can develop later on. But it's really good to be able to try and memorize positions in your head without really looking at the board. Because once you develop the board in your mind, you can then start playing with possibilities. And that's what higher ELO players do. They can, rec in a sense, you should be able to, if you're like, say, an 1800 or 1900 player, I think personally in your mind, you should be able to close your eyes and recite at least the first 10, 12 moves of a game, black and white, without while being able to keep that mental image in your head. And if you're able to practice doing that, then you're going to be able to see and process things a lot faster, especially in blitz games, because then it's just pattern recognition and you can just see it in your head and, and it'll just kick in and it'll just make you go a lot faster in, in your responses to your opponent's moves. So I'm just going to give you a couple more seconds to think about it. Okay, let's get into the game now. And let's go together and see what really transpired here. Uh, I'm also going to speak from a, like, a, like a teaching point of view of what I think black and white should have obviously done in this situation. So this is very, the opening I'm just going to kind of fly by, it's pretty basic and it's something that if you're learning Sicilian you should know, you should have an understanding of, of how to respond for both black and white. Because obviously in openings if you play the wrong move it becomes a lot trickier and it can s slowly slow ball to, snowball to an advantage for your opponent. So white plays e4, knights, uh, bishop, I mean uh, pawn to c5, so we're going through to Sicilian. Knight f3, knight c6, d4, pawn takes d4, knight responds by taking the pawn back, knight f6, knight c3, pawn to d6, again, very simple, very standard, there's no advantage by, from either opponent right now. Bishop to, b, to e3, pawn to a6, bishop to c4. So white has an understanding of they're deciding that they want to 
kind of focus really on the center. And the key for white right now is they want to focus on d5. They want complete control of that spot, so that way later on, as the time goes on, they can take their knight and and push. How do you do this? Yeah, there you go. And you push it over to d5, so that way you get a little control of all these key spots. And since you have the bishop here on e3, this is a nice spot later on for targeting that specific spot on b6. So that's kind of the understanding that white is right now exhibiting. And black has many options in terms of how to control it. Uh, usually they want to control it with their own active counterplay too. So black responds by playing g6. Again, this is very standard in my mind too. Obviously, white has white's having a lot more space, so that's usually the case when it comes to these type of positions. While black's kind of resorting to more of a uh, a dragonish slash like hedgehog spot. Basically, everything is on the third line and back, and it's basically building up to a, a very solid defense. White castles continuing with their development, and. Black responds by playing the queen on c7. So this spot is obviously okay now, more importantly because we have the pawn on a6 to prevent any knight moves from coming over here. Keep in mind though that this pawn should eventually be heading over to b5. And the reason why is because you really want to get some space over it. You really want to get this bishop developed on, on b7. That's really important. There's really not that many spots over here, unless the bishop goes here, where the black bishop can really be developed. Obviously, you can't have it on this spot anymore on e6, because then after the exchange, black's going to lose a pawn. So b5 is something that needs to take place very soon, so that way black can then start developing. And then, more importantly, get these rooks connected. Bishop respo uh, white response by playing bishop on b3, so moving the bishop away from any type of of uh, any type of tactics of knight taking the knight exchange and then followed by capturing the bishop on b4 or c4. Black plays bishop g7, and white plays f3. Now, again, this is very solid. There's really uh, this is a matter of preference. You might have seen other games too where white rather will be a little bit more aggressive and they will play f4. Again, but it really depends on what white's planning. Right now, they're, white's pl focusing more on the d5 spot, which is what I'm noticing. And the problem is, is that if you play f4, you're kind of weakening this e4 pawn, which then later on, when black starts playing b5, followed by bishop to b7 now black has a target and the target is e4 while white's really focusing on d5 so this is kind of, this is pretty nice this is a uh, pretty solid black castles and white goes to d2 again white is exhibiting an understanding that they want to try and get everything developed first before they start really getting into black's territory so White on the queen going to d2 is a very multi-purpose move because now you have a battery of the bishop which can go straight over to h6 in case you want to take that route. And also the rooks are connected, which is really good because now the rooks can go anywhere to support either rook to e1 or rook to d1 or vice versa. Black responded by playing bishop to d7. Now, this is, in my mind, it's still okay. However, you're kind of feeling a little bit squeezed. I know that the rooks are connected, so at least black's development is happening. But you really need to consider playing b5. And the reason why is because now you have to be aware that there's always these tactics later on where white will try and move in with the knight on a4 targeting this square because b6 is weak, weak right now and the whole key of this is why you want to put your pawn black's pawn on 
b5 is to ensure that knight can't easily get to that spot without first traveling over to d5. So white responds with knight d5, which I think it's always good to be proactive rather than reactive. Again, white is exhibiting that understanding, which again, in my mind, is separate is definitely um, a cause for a for uh, a concern that black is really trying to util trying to come up with a plan and eliminate all these weakened spots. White has a plan, and it looks like they're they're going forward with it, and that in my mind, white makes the first step of going, well, I wouldn't say taking the initiative, but is the one that's trying to create chances to give themselves an advantage. So this is pretty good. Black responds by obviously taking getting rid of that knight, and bishop to e, d5 is taken. Uh, this is fine. You definitely don't want to take with e to with the e pawn, I think that's a mistake. Uh, you definitely want to keep that e4 pawn here, so that way you can still maintain control over the d5 square. So the plan is still the same. e6 is played. Now, I, I feel as though this is the move where if I was in black's Side, I don't know if I would have played e6. And the only reason why I wouldn't play e6 is that, yes, this bishop is very annoying on d5. But now what's happened is that you have the weakening of the d6 square. And if you remember from the game where I, I, I kind of showed it a little bit quickly, you realize that that's, starting to, that's going to become a problem. And one thing that at this ELO that you don't want to do is you don't want to give your opponent extra opportunity to attack your weakened areas. So if you give them a target that they will focus on, it's going to put you on the defensive and it's automatically going to give your opponent more options to try and get an advantage and then convert that advantage to a possible win. So this pawn on d6 is definitely going to become a problem later on. And the thing is that white is very open right now, which means they, when you're open, you can technically be, be faster in responding and making moves to, to really try and capitalize on, on weakened spots on your enemy's side. So definitely, we're going to see those rooks come in, and then they're going to just focus on this particular spot. So bishop goes to b3, which is very sensible. And rook is now moved from a to c. Again, this is kind of interesting. Um, I still feel as though pawn to b5 should have played been played a lot sooner. Uh, the reason being is that now that we know that the rooks are coming to c8 to have some strength along this line. You want to really look at c4 as a target for black to get their knight on. I think that's a very nice spot. And in order to solidify that, you definitely want to have your pawns go from b7 to b5. So that way they can control that square. Just like how white right now is controlling the d5 square. Pawn goes to c3. Again, this is natural in the sense that it's we're now limiting the scope of the knight. So there's going to be no spots where the knight goes to c4. And it automatically activates the kind of battery ram, battering ram that black is exhibiting right now on the c column. At the same time, you're strengthening the d4 square. So that way, there's now multiple pieces that are guarding the knight on d4, which is... Nice and centralized right now. Knight goes to a5. So again, this is an idea to go target this spot on c4. However, one consideration that could be made is that the knight instead may go to e5. And the reason why it can go to e5 is that it won't be knocked away from this pawn because obviously if the pawn goes to f4, Knight can then travel over to g4 and then threaten this bishop. And 
that's good. We want to get rid of that dark square bishop, so that way we have all the control of the black squares. However, there's also a possibility that when the knight goes to e5, bishop can be played to f4, and then there could be some threats here. But what you really want to do is that you really want to get rid of this d6 pawn, but not through white taking it. You kind of want to use this to kind of open the position up and make it, I guess I would say, a little bit more breathable for black. Because right now white's having a lot of uh, space. Knights on a5, or, or this a column, are good when they can suddenly be rerouted to these key squares like c4. But otherwise, you kind of want to move your pieces towards the center. After you observe, it, observe that there's not really any threats, knights blunt in the center. You never want to really keep pieces on the side because they become less active. And especially when things go into trouble, it's going to take more time to get your knight back into the center and back into the game, whether offensively or defensively. So you want to consider that in the future. White responds naturally by playing the rook from f to d1. Again, targeting the d6 pawn. So white is definitely exhibiting understanding in this position. And black responds by playing the rook on e8. I guess it's okay in a sense because you you might you can protect your pawn from any type of possible uh, sacrifices or anything involving this bishop that's uh, aiming towards the king. But again, I still think that b5 really should have been played right now, or at least minimum play the knight on c4. I've noticed in games, especially in this ELO, where opponent uh, people are kind of hesitant in playing the moves that directly affect the board and honestly it's better if you just do it than not do it that way the pace changes and you can you don't want to have white in this spot if you're black always being able being able to dictate the pace and control and to initiate if that makes sense right now white's in the spot where they're planning to go after they they have a plan and black's plan is to get activity and you know neutralize this bishop which is becoming uh, quite a menace right now because it's nice and open bishop for white goes to f2 now i can only surmise is the reason why you want to do this is that he is planning to reroute the bishop to either g3 which again focusing the d square or even possibly move to h4 so controlling this line here which again that is pretty acceptable however you have to consider the two that the knight is kind of is planning to come to c4 so this also moves the bishop out of the way which is a which is very good in terms of making sure that the knight doesn't threaten both pieces right off the bat so preserving the white bishop against their counterpart with the black knight definitely really important e5 is played for black interesting so in this spot I would think that I would think that this is the move where I'm definitely not as comfortable with and, the, and in fact I think this would in my mind this would kind of be where things start to go really wrong it's very clear that now this pawn is extremely weak on D and the fact is, is that you're also blocking your own bishop now. It's the bishop is now in a supporting role, but you want to have be have have the bishop be in a supporting, but with reach. And there's now no reach with this e this e pawn blocking here. Also, the fact is, is that this bishop now has chances to go to e6 or to go on to the queen side. But again, there's now holes that are starting to come about. Even if the knight here goes straight to c4, after exchange, white can just go straight up and take this pawn. And then now they just crack black in. And then afterwards, they just stack the rooks further on the d, on the d column. And it just becomes slowly lights out. 
So right responds with play the knight on c2. Again, very logical. And bishop take is taken by the knight. This, as much as they really wanted to play the knight on c4, I'm not sure of this. Because even though white is taking the pawn, the knight with the pawn, now white gets all these squares and they have much more control. And even though the black bishop can now go to e6, it always seems to be that white is one step ahead. And that's kind of important with this in these situations. And the reason why they can stay one step ahead is because they are focusing specifically on black's weaknesses with this queen going straight down here with a, its own battering ram. So I feel like in this spot, it's kind of like slowly the damage is done and white is just has faster tempo, faster pace. Pawn takes the knight. And rook is played to e6. Again, this is kind of an ugly move. You don't want your rook, especially blocking your own pieces, such as the bishop, who is really trying to get some activity and hasn't really done anything throughout this entire game. However, alternatives could have been could have been made. Maybe the bishop could have went to f8 instead. That way, later on, the knight could the bishop can then go to e6 and then start really raining down, uh, covering the D square. So, let's look at it. Bishop goes to F8. Yeah, there, those possibilities can matter. In fact, it's sometimes it's also even possible that I've seen in, in, in play where Sacrificing this pawn by playing it on d5 can sometimes give black that breathing space where they can actually get all their pieces active. Um, but definitely right now, bishop this bishop here is is not active. So considering it playing on f8, so that way it, it can then rain down over here and at least cover this these type of spots might be more plausible than playing this rook on e6, which is quite ugly in my opinion. Knight is played to a3. Now, this is where I think, personally, the knight should have went to b4. And the reason why is because if you play knight to a3, and then black finally plays b5, this knight isn't going to do anything. So the fact of the matter is, is that you want the knight to... You will have to rewrite, or reroute the knight again, which is wasting time and you don't want to waste time right now especially when you're I wouldn't say you're in an advantageous spot but you definitely have the initiative so in this case I would have played the knight on b4 for sure because it's still going to give me the chance to put my knight on d5 which is what you want to do and then get your knight on b6 to cause some major problems so bishop is now played to f8 and again it just seems to me that black is one move behind at all times this pawn should have been on b5 a long time ago and this is kind of where it exhibits black's lack of understanding in this game knight goes to c4 so now it's starting to become really bothersome the knight is going to go to b6 and there's nothing that can stop this and it's going to cause even more problems Bishop is played to b5. Again, this is tough now because after the knight goes to b6, which you know it's happening, now white can increase their lead by playing the pawn on c4 and now gaming tempo by attacking this bishop and forcing it to move elsewhere. So this move I didn't I don't I still wouldn't like playing the bishop here. And again, b5 now no longer works because after the knight goes to c to b6, now rook has another target. Black has another target by targeting this a pawn, which is now longer being defended by a b pawn. So this is where now that this is another great example where black is possibly creating multiple threats just by invading 
this black territory and taking advantage of these key uh, these key squares. And once you have multiple attacks on your opponent, your opponent has to pretty much play perfect in order to just survive. That's the key. Not even win, just survive. So it's always good being the aggressor in this spot. Knights play to b6. Again, now attacking the rook. Now considering going to d5. And white just picks up a lot of tempo here. Black plays rook to d8. Again, kind of forced. You really have to. And knight goes to d5. So now this is the square where this is really bothersome for black. And now it also opens the possibilities of the bishop playing to b6. Again, squeezing black slowly into submission. White goes to, I mean, black goes to d7. And now black is playing h4. This is, again, a really tough spot because now there's all the threats of the knight coming into f6. And basically forcing a rook with bishop trade, which is now... Black's actually gaining material. So now the initiative is now being slowly converting to an advantage. Yeah, this is still, this is kind of a rough spot. Uh, even that you can't even play f6 because then the pawn gets taken. So it's just, it's really tough here. Black plays bishop to a g7. Protecting this square, but again, this is now not good because this pawn is now losing protection, which you don't want this pawn. You can't lose this pawn because as soon as you lose this pawn and the queen moves in over here, it, everything's just going to become messed up. The queen's just going to start reigning and their goal is going to try to now trade with black's queen. And that's one thing you want to keep in mind. Um, so for the 1,200, 1,500 yellow players, Whenever you're winning, you want to trade pieces. Remember that. Whenever you're losing, you want to trade pawns because that's their best way of trying to go for a draw. While it's obviously, if you're a material head, you want to trade material. Now, again, it depends on the board. It depends on the situation. If pawn structures are very heavy like this, knights are obviously more preferred than bishops. So, again, it, it's very it's situational too. But the main understanding is that if you're playing like 10-minute classical games, etc., and you do have a situation like this, you want to trade everything off. You because it's going to make it a lot easier to to increase the advantage and, and produce a win out of it. So rook is taken by white on d8, and queen is capturing the bishop. And now c4 is played. So again. This is what I was talking about earlier. Bishop has to retreat, has no other choice. Bishop is played to c6. Again, the only move where it can stay as, as active as much as possible. Queen goes to a5. Again, very good move from white. Um, the 1600 ELO player understands is that now you want to trade material as much as possible. And if once the queen moves out of the way, quite white has now captured taken control of all these black squares which now white could proceed to start invading um, afterwards there's also the possibility of this pawn moving up so just breaking through on the queen side more if i was black the only consideration assuming that the threat isn't as strong as it was earlier with the queens is that you might want to consider playing f5 and break hold of the center and then kind of and start engaging with your pieces. Unfortunately, this isn't really good now because the problem is that because white has two rooks, they can control the lanes a lot easier. So consider that while white is kind of aiming on the queen side, black can always respond by counterattacking. And you kind of want to make sure that in like psychology, you want to make it's always nice to disrupt the plan of your opponent and make them separate themselves between not just having being a pure attacker but oh wait I gotta defend too so once you keep making them make those decisions it makes things a little bit easier in the long run white 
I mean, black response by playing a rook on e8. Again, this is a mistake. This is now, in my mind, losing because now the queens are going to exchange and then the knight's coming to e8 followed by taking the bishop. So you can see this plan already forming. And as black, you want to keep the queens as long as possible on the board. Having the queen going here on g5 is in my mind, probably the only move that I would consider maybe by pushing the pawns because at least now I'm trying to gain as an activity as much as possible. Um, one thing, oops, sorry, that was my alarm. One thing I have, I have to consider is that you have dark square control with this bishop. So trying to produce counterplay, which might give you a chance to, to neutralize white's edge, which they have right now. But again, it's still very hard because this pawn is under fire and there's a lot of weaknesses going on on black side. Queens are exchanged, knights played e7. Again, the whole plan is to exchange as much pieces as possible and obviously the white foresees that this pawn is now gonna fall as well. Knight goes to, uh, king goes to f8, knight takes the bishop, pawn gets captured, and rook goes to a6. Again, this is now completely hopeless. Uh, there's no way that black can have a chance of coming back from this. Uh, the rook, it's a very open field. The double rooks are going to start really focusing on these pawns, and the bishop is still, sadly, it's going to take a couple of moves for this bishop to even get active. Even if they go through here, white can just centralize the king more, and then just neutralize the bishop even further. So it's very unfortunate. Pawn goes to c5. Again, insignificant. Pawn is taken on d6. So the weakness finally was exploited and captured. And that's how the game ends. So I hope this... I really talked a lot in this video. So I really hope that this kind of gave an understanding between the difference between, in my mind, 1200 to 1500. And the key word is understanding. White had a plan, and White executed it. And again, it's not necessary to the point where you always have to be the one pushing to get an advantage. Sometimes you can even play the waiting game and just let your opponent slip up and then just take advantage of this situation. In this case, it was a bit of both. White was going for a centralization, and Black was playing not so, such in my mind, understanding moves, such as, for example, that pawn b7, have to go to b5. When you start to understand what to do in these situations, it's going to make things a lot easier. And then it's going to give you a chance to counterattack and, and counterplay what your opponent is doing. Uh, so if there is a, an overall tip of what I would say to both players is... An easy way to break it down in your mind is consider what moves you want to have, like what spots where you want to have your best pieces on, and what spots do you think your opponent wants to put their piece on, and figure out a way to neutralize it. And when you start thinking that way, you will your understanding will grow. And when your understanding grows, you'll be able to win a lot more games. So I hope that everyone got a bit of information of this and, and some enjoyment uh, again this wasn't really the cleanest in terms of presentation format this is the first time I've ever done it from a, a YouTube standpoint usually when I'm live with a person in training it's it's a lot easier more comfortable for me but this goes to show that when you push your boundaries and you do something uncomfortable you will become better overall and it'll yield to great results so I hope everyone understands uh my first time actually doing this on a, on a recording. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm going to be working on the 15 to 1800 video actually right now. So I'm going to start producing some more content for the Heart of Chess. I'm also going to start a, new, a couple of new series too with chess. I really want to start... I want to... <laughs> it's funny because I was playing some speed games earlier and... I was doing really bad. I, I was just like tilted. And I feel as though I kind of want to start a series calling Tilted Chess, where how can you, after losing 8, 9, 10 games, basically get rid of the tilt and get back into the winning track? So I think that's going to be more of like of a live 
uh, live of uh, live recording of me playing and giving my thoughts while playing Blitz and and Bullet, etc. Um, I don't know if I'm going to play a lot of classical games on the board. I I really don't enjoy classical games online. I rather to play it on the board, like thirty minutes, forty, six minute games. I think it's just in terms of preference. Uh, it, it won't stop my abilities, but Again, we, we play to what we like, and that's what's really important, because we want to keep the game really fun. Unless it's tournaments, in that case. Well, as a competitive player, we like winning. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, please leave your feedback in the, co in the comments section below. Uh, I love hearing from all of you in terms of what you guys, ha sorry, what you folks have to say. I read everything. I reply to, I would say, 90% of the comments, so by all means. Give me your feedback. What did you learn today? If you learned something from this lesson, then or this video in particular, then I achieved my objective. And that's really awesome. So take care, everyone. Have a good night. And I'll see you later on.